Again, welcome to everybody who's joining us. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, there is a Mentimeter in the chat box as we're trying to learn a little bit about you and what you're thinking about the topic today. So if you have a chance as we wait to click on that link and give us some of your thoughts about the topic of coordination and localization during COVID-19. All right, we'll get our session started. Thank you everybody for joining us. I have a hard time seeing numbers, but I know we're 100 over 100 people, which really points to the interest in localization um, uh, during this and, and coordination during this time of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Joanna Wedge, and I am the facilitator of this session. Um, it's been a real pleasure to watch this session come together. Um, there's lots of interesting panelists who are going to bring you some of their experiences as well as engage with you to hear about what you see as opportunities and challenges of localization um, in child protection coordination in COVID-19, but also going forward. And we really want to see through this session how more coordination groups can adopt localization initiatives and support national and local actors in taking a lead role. So I think the way this has been structured with some presentations and case studies and questions to you and so on is a really interactive forum for both learning or learning from, from all the actors um, who have gathered together today in this room. So we have uh, about 50 minutes to, um, to come together and have these discussions. Um, there's quite an interesting flow, as I say, that gives a chance for our great speakers to present uh, from their different perspectives, uh, as well as to get your ideas um, in different activities, but also in the chat box. Um, if you'd like to put any question or any clarity that you need in the chat box, then please do go ahead and do that throughout the whole session. So my role is fairly short in this, uh, beyond being timekeeper in the background. Um, it's really up to all the speakers who will be taking us forward. So first of all, I'm going to pass over to the session moderator. Um, I've had the great pleasure to know the moderator, today's moderator, for over 15 years. Um, she brings a huge wealth of knowledge and experience to this session. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Fatuma Ibrahim. Uh, she is the Global Child Protection AOR's lead on localization. So Fatima, over to you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much to all of you for joining this session. We are delighted to see so many of you coming to join. It just shows how important this session is. Now, the focus of our session is going to be very much shifting the norms in child protection cluster coordination, which we know very well is very much led by international actors. So the speakers today are going to share their experiences in how they've been supporting national and local actors in playing bigger roles in the coordination mechanism, both at national and subnational levels. They also talk about the challenges they've encountered, but also the opportunities that exist. And they'll also touch on the um, critical role that local actors are playing in the response to COVID-19. Shall we have the Mentimeter, Joanna? So some of you have already pointed out um, those roles, but I wanted to, while I'm waiting for the Mentimeter to come up, I wanted to share an observation during the, um, the opening session. I think there was a lot that was said about localization and maybe the question that remains is why are we not making the progress that we should be making when we see the need? We know it's not only important, but it's also the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. If you saw the questions that they asked us um, on the poll, there was one on which organization type was being represented. And you know what? 12% are local or national NGOs or original. And then INGOs was 54%. That is so telling. But you will hear more from the 
our six panelists who are coming from uh, Al Gad organization, which is in Iraq, a Grow Strong Foundation in Nigeria, Save the Children, Street Child UK, and UNICEF. And I know you are all very eager to listen to the um, to the speakers. So before I just start introducing them, I wanted to pick out some of the few things you've said. The role of local actors in CP coordination in your country. People are mentioning co lead at the subnational level. I haven't seen any co lead at the national level, but so we'll be hearing about that. And um, there's an interesting one. People are saying they are part of the coordination groups, but very few co lead but definitely they're included, they're included in decision-making. We'll hear more about how that works. How are they um, included in decision-making? But allow me to go ahead and introduce the first three set of speakers. So we will have Joyce Mutiso. Joyce is the coordinator for the child protection subsector in Northeast Nigeria, and she's from UNICEF. Allow me also to introduce Sarah John Gema. Sarah is the co-coordinator in the child protection subsector in Northeast Nigeria. Sarah works with uh, Joyce and she is from Grow, Grow Strong Foundation. And then in the same team, we'll have Megan Liz McCohen. Megan is the Africa head of programs for Street Child UK. Joyce, Sarah, and Megan, you have the floor. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Joyce. I'm the Child Protection Subsector Coordinator in Northeast Nigeria, and I'm going to speak briefly about the work that we've done in terms of localization and coordination. So in 2019, we did le developed a strategy note and the purpose of the strategy note was to highlight and um, understand what gains we had ma ma made at the time in terms of localization uh, within the subsector. And we also looked at uh, what the challenges were for localization within the subsector and we identified approaches of addressing those challenges. That took us to a discussion within the subsector of how we can improve localization, particularly within coordination. And we agreed that we would have a national NGO. And when we say national, we mean national stroke local. So we agreed to have a national NGO that would co-lead um, the subsector. We then developed terms of reference for the NGO co-lead organization and through a competitive selection process that was led by the strategic advisory group of the subsector, we identified Grow Strong Foundation as the organization that would co-lead the subsector. We then developed specific terms of reference for the NGO co-coordinator and identified Sarah John Gamer, who's here with us today as the co-coordinator through a selective process. After Sarah took up her post, we've been supporting her in various ways, primarily through our consistent coaching and mentoring sessions that we have on a weekly basis, not only on technical knowledge in child protection, but also on coordination skills. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we found that is most helpful um, for this, uh, for the success that we've seen is to have clear roles and responsibilities designated between the coordinator and the co-coordinator so that the co-coordinator does not end up being a deputy of the coordinator, but has very clear roles and responsibilities that they're able to um, deliver on and to be accountable uh, for. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. So, um, please, can you move to the next slide, Susanna? So, upon taking up this um, strategy and of localization at the subnational level here in Nigeria, we have about 60% of the CPSS membership which is uh, local and national NGOs. And the reason we have this is because we want to have a strong um, connection with the community level. We try to see that we involve the community members. That is why most of our membership for the subsector are national. I think we have a it problem. Seems, yeah, it, it seems that Sarah's connection is not working properly. So maybe Joyce could uh, continue. 
Okay, so very quickly to um, pick up from where Sarah left and please allow me not to have my video because we are both in my degree and I think we are having challenges with the network. So within the subsector, about 60% of the membership is of local and national organizations. And this has provided us with an opportunity to see how we can strengthen the linkage between community networks and the child protection actors in the COVID-19 response. So we see that as an opportunity. During the lockdown measures uh, specifically, we adapted the localization approach to support national organizations to access personal protective equipment, to develop IEC materials that were translated in various languages, and to also um, have megaphones or what you would call town criers to support uh, dissemination of information on COVID-19 specifically for children. And lastly, one of the things that we've also seen as an opportunity and a step forward was to look at how we address the barriers of, uh, to information and access to services for the affected population through working very strongly and closely with Translators Without Borders to translate and interpret messages and information in local languages in Northeast Nigeria. Over to you, Megan. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joyce and Sarah. I mean, this is a fantastic step towards localization in Northeast Nigeria, and we at Street Child are really pleased to have supported through our projects with the CPAOR. So what I wanted to briefly speak about next brings us right up to date with the current pandemic, and that is the essential role of local actors in rapid response. Local actors are some of the most cost-effective, efficient, and relevant responders in emergency contexts. As many of you noted in the Mentimeter, they can access tough areas, are connected to what affected people need, and understand what responses will or won't work and why. Yet in global humanitarian funding terms, most are getting just crumbs from the table. The 2020 Grand Bargain uh, report found only 3.7% of humanitarian funding is going to local actors. And more than ever in the COVID-19 pandemic with international travel brought to a standstill, local actors have been called upon to respond. But three months in, just 0.1% of the Global Humanitarian Response Plan was going directly to local actors. So this project uh, with the CPAOR allowed Street Child to pivot to immediately prioritize rapid response funding for local actors. We drew uh, in particular on our experience in the Ebola crisis of the critical role of local actors in sharing health information from a position of trust understanding contextual barriers, and seeing the bigger humanitarian picture beyond the health crisis. So by April, we'd kicked off a first phase rapid response fund across our four contexts, that's Afghanistan, Bangladesh, DR Congo, and Nigeria. The fund supported uh, nine local protection actors to mobilize for COVID-19 preparedness and prevention in their local communities, mapping needs, and gaining a field presence and position of community trust early on. So all the actors Street Child supported have since scaled their COVID response, and many have won funding from other sources to further scale up with support from our resource mobilization help desk to connect to other funding sources. You know, the Rapid Response Fund really helped catalyze early local action, making capable local actors visible and overall strengthening the child protection subsector's capacity to respond to COVID-19 early on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, Joyce, for highlighting your experiences in Northeast Nigeria as part of the localization um, initiative that is supported by the CPR and sharing the opportunities and maybe some of the challenges that you experience, but most importantly, pointing out the critical role of uh, local actors in the COVID-19 response. Now we are going to allow um, the participants to have or to raise questions on the very short but very clear presentations from Sarah, Joyce, and Megan. And we will ask the Mentimeter to be provided. It's actually been provided. Yes, I just put it in the chat now for you, Fatima. Okay. If you look uh, in the chat, uh, you will see the Mentimeter. Please click on it. You will find a question which would like you to, sorry, would like you to 
to give us questions about what you think the role of national actors are in the COVID-19 response. Please click on the Mentimeter. So, okay, this is the, um, is this the first one now? So yes. do we have any example of a localization strategy from Syria. How does the global localization approach apply to government of Syria areas, areas in Syria, or what does it say on Syria government? I think I only have, I can, I, I will try and answer this, but I have the answer for the first part. In the last few weeks, the Global Protection Cluster has been having the annual forum. And during the annual forum, we did hear a lot about um, localization in Syria. The participants for Syria, from Syria talked about how there was a huge focus on working with local and national NGOs and in some cases, local authorities as well, because that was the best way and perhaps the easiest way of getting humanitarian response to the affected situation. We have asked to see whether they actually had a strategy as such. We, what we heard from them is that they used the humanitarian needs overview and the humanitarian response plan to focus on this. So I don't think they, there was a different strategy as such, but they did focus on the HNOs and the HRP. And that's how they provided a lot more funding to local and national NGOs to provide the response. I'm very sorry, I don't have a response for the second part of the question, but if somebody has, please go ahead and provide that. If not, we'll move on to the next question. Sorry, it did go back up with one before. Sorry, it's being a little silly with me right now, but there's the next one for you. Uh, sorry, Fatima, it seems you're muted at the moment. Yeah, so what were the challenges experienced during the co-coordination and how were they addressed or will they be addressed? Is there any area the coordination would like to highlight as a gap? Over to you, Joyce. I think what I would say that uh, we identify, I would say is a gap, not necessarily that we identified as a gap, is the fact that Sarah took up her role just as COVID-19 kicked off. So that opportunity to have the one-to-one -one, um, mentoring was uh, kicked out of the park a little bit and we've had to do our coaching and mentoring online. Um, I would also have wanted to uh, go to the field together with Sarah to visit the sites where child protection workers uh, are implementing to have hands-on experience in the field with her. But unfortunately for about three or four months, we were not able to do that. So interestingly, we had the opportunities, but this was affected by COVID-19, but we took up, the, we tried to address that by using the day weekly mentoring sessions uh, with Sarah. And we also looked at her supporting, uh, getting support from Fatuma, for example, localization, as well as on technical aspects. And she did a lot of online training on various courses to do GBV coordination and so forth. So we try to make the best out of what we had. Thank you. I would like to compliment uh, Joyce's response. Thank you very much, Joyce. In overall, I think one big challenge is finding funding to cover the cost of a co-coordinator. We've had this from other coordination mechanisms that yes, they may be able to identify a co-lead, a co-coordinator, but finding the resources to cover that is usually very difficult. In the case of Nigeria, they managed to do it and it's both because of uh, the work that the CPOR did, but also the work that was done by Street Child. So I would like to request uh, Megan to just add a few, uh, I mean, to speak very briefly on the effort Street Child has done to make sure that there is funding for the co-coordination. 
Thanks very much, Fatuma. Yeah, it's it's absolutely a challenge that's been identified to us across the, the four countries that we were uh, working in, that funding for the co-coordinator um, is absolutely critical because uh, often the extra responsibilities are asked of, of local partners um, who, who lack the resources, uh, both human and financial, to take up that co-coordination co role. Uh, so, in fact, in this project, we specifically allocated resources for uh, the ongoing salary for the uh, co-coordinator in, in northeast Nigeria um, in particular, so that they could backfill um, that position within uh, their organization, since somebody who has the, the skills and capabilities to take on that role is often very valuable. Uh, and I know Sarah is very valuable at Grow Strong as well. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm really afraid that this is all we have um, because we had only a few minutes to respond to the questions, but I can see that we have 21 questions. We will do what Hani and Audrey said at the beginning. We will compile these questions and we will provide responses. And before the end of the annual meeting, we'll provide the answers to all of you who attended this session. I would now like to continue um, with the program and I'm going to call upon the next set of speakers who are going to talk to us about the impact of coaching and mentoring, potential co-coordinators or coordinators in Iraq. I would like to introduce Nares Mahmoud, who is the co-coordinator for the child protection uh, subcluster in Iraq, and she is from Save the Children. Nares will be presenting along with um, Salah Hassan, who is the co-coordinator for the Aninewa Child Protection Working Group in Iraq. Um, Salah is hosted by the Al Rad organization in Iraq. Nares and Salah, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Fatuma, and thank you for joining, guys. Um, I think you did a very wise decision and you will not regret it. Um, so I hope the slide will be showing on, on the screen soon. And I also hope you watched the, our videos on the um, Alliance's YouTube channel where we had a brief about the localization of child protection in Iraq. Uh, but here we would just like to, to maybe elaborate more on the capacity building. Um, next slide, please, Kat. Um, so for the capacity building of the local or the national coordinators, which on the national and uh, subnational level, now all of us are national staff, we started with, a, with an online survey to assess the capacity of each coordinator to, to, to see where are the strengths and the areas for development. And then based on the result, we developed a bilateral um, capacity capacity, a personalized capacity building plan with each coordinator. And uh, we then shared a list of training, online training that are available on different platforms with each coordinator for them to benefit from. Uh, we also had a regular coaching call, coaching session bilaterally with each coordinator to focus on the well-being uh, and on the operation side of the CP coordination, as well on the, uh, on the challenges they face and we follow up on the trainings that they are taking as well. We also decided to have some group coaching calls. Uh, we usually have a bi-weekly uh, group calls. Uh, we discuss the operation side of the CP coordination in different locations, but we dedicate some of these coaching sessions, uh, some of these group session to coaching uh, sessions as well. Um, for example, now we are in the HNO HRP season. So we are deciding to, to focus more on the HPC um, uh, steps uh, and share what are the, the step of the of, of, of the process and to um, engage more the national um, staff in the humanitarian program cycle steps. And my colleague Salah will share his experience from as a, as a participant side. Salah, over to you. Thank you, Nora, so much. And hi, everybody. This is Salah Hassan from Naino, Child, Naino Iraq Child Protection Working Group. And now I am leading, I am co-leading the uh, child protection working group. Uh, in fact, for the uh, for the or uh, throughout the individual uh, 
uh, coaching sessions as I am co-leading the Nano Child Protection Working Group. I have been collecting precious information and knowledge, and uh, in fact, uh, they are very interesting and uh, strengthening my capacities. They are also uh, represent uh, such as uh, a quick available good uh, guidance when I need support uh, throughout co-leading the, uh, 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 the child protection working group. Uh, in addition for the uh, group coaching sessions, uh, in fact, uh, different suggestions, opinions, and uh, point of views uh, are uh, usually presented by the uh, coordinate, uh, coordinators during the sessions, uh, which usually uh, gives the opportunity uh, to various uh, to various solutions for the uh, current or for the potential challenges that may occur uh, soon or uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Nora, and over to you again. Thank you, but we also have some challenges, of course. One of the challenges is, next slide, please, thank you. So one of the challenges was with the remote modality after COVID. So there was, we had different challenges with using technology in country. Uh, another challenge is um, the uh, dedicated time of the, of the coordinators where it is only 20% and because they are very capable, they internally, their organization put lots of pressure on them. But this is also a chance to maybe um, just to conclude that donors and international organization need to rethink the partnership with the national organization so they can contribute more and fund more the child protection coordination in the future because it needs a long time dedication. Uh, so for us not to face any staff turnover. Um, and uh, thank you over to you. I, I hope I was on time. Yes, you are, Naris. Uh, Naris and uh, Salah, thank you so much uh, for sharing your very good experience and highlighting the work that you've done in terms of mentoring and coaching the uh, coordinators and um, uh, co-coordinators from national and uh, local NGOs, but also from the government as well. I think that's a point that we need to uh, stress that is not only limited uh, to NGOs. It was also local authority. I'm now going to hand over to Susanna, but before I do that, let me give a short introduction of who Susanna is. Susanna Davis is the Senior Coordinator for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action for Save the Children. She is going to take us through a short exercise to reflect on what Anaris and Salah has just shared. Over to you, Susanna. Thanks very much, Fastuman, and thanks to um, to Noraz and Salah and Joyce and Sarah and Megan as well um, for all the really great presentations so far. I hope participants have been able to get a, a little bit of a perspective of um, the different challenges and also really important successes that they've been able to achieve in their different contexts. Uh, we'd love to invite participants now to have the opportunity to share a bit um, their own experiences. In just a moment, we're going to send you um, to a four different breakout rooms uh, where you'll have um, a little bit less than 10 minutes now to con consider the question, what tools and resources are needed in your context to improve localization and coordination? So if this is something that you are going to hopefully be able to take up, if it's not already being prioritized in the response where you work, or maybe the responses that you support, um, what kind of tools and resources would you need to do that? Um, there will, your feedback is something that we hope to take into account in uh, a forthcoming toolkit on localization and coordination that's being developed jointly by the different organizations on this panel. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, you can use Mentimeter to log some of your ideas um, and that will help us keep uh, track of them. So I'll go ahead and ask the producer to send you to the breakout groups and some of the panelists will join you to, to support facilitating that discussion. And we'll see you back here in a few minutes.
Hi, everybody. This is the producer, Katrina. I just wanted to let you know that the Mentimeter link has been shared in the chat so that you can use that once you go into your breakout rooms. I'm going to assign you to your breakout rooms now. Um, I just ask that the presenters that will be going to specific breakout rooms, if you can just kindly reject the first invitation that you get, um, just so I can make sure I put you in the correct breakout rooms um, once everybody's gone, if that's all right. Great. Thank you. Welcome back. If you're coming back from the um, from the breakout rooms, I can see that um, I think there are still quite a few who are not back. So I'll just give them a moment. Um, wait for our numbers to go up slightly. Uh, you can see on the screen now um, some of the um, some of the responses to uh, to the discussions. I know that they were um, were probably far too short. Um, but it looks like the, quite a few very interesting ideas. Oh, and I can see everybody flooding back into the room now. Welcome back. Um, we've just put up on the screen um, some of your ideas from, um, from the, I know, quite short breakout, uh, breakout sessions. I've seen quite a few on different kind of technical and institutional capacity building tools needed. Um, I see a fair number of pointing out kind of in terms of resources needed, really needed um, funding to provide kind of that consistent um, support and mentoring for national NGOs who take on coordination processes um, and also to provide support for, for national NGOs themselves. Um, I can see quite a, I can see a couple about um, more about human resources um, to be dedicated to coordination. I think this reflects very much some of the things that were, were brought up in the presentations. Um, how and how local partners can engage with, uh, with UN capacity building pack. I think that's quite an interesting uh, suggestion for us as well. So I won't take um, tons of time to, to go through all the others, except to say I see a few references to uh, capacity building around the child protection minimum standards, which is is lovely to to see and to recognize that that's a, a tool for for local actors as well, and one that we hope will kind of level the playing field. Um, so it kind of it now falls to me to try and wrap up a session which has just really flown by. Um, thank you all so much um, for joining us to talk about localization and child protection coordination. I think you can all agree that the time was too short and we were really pleased to have such a strong and engaged group. Um, we've heard from colleagues in Nigeria and Iraq about the different approaches they took to strengthening local leadership in COVID-19 response and beyond. In both cases, international actors like Street Child, Save the Children, and the CPAOR worked collaboratively with national actors like the Algad Organization and Grow Strong Foundation to identify the best pathways for change. Um, the different presenters highlighted challenges and barriers that they found along the way, from the practical need to make translation and interpretation available, uh, to more complex negotiations um, about identifying clear roles and responsibilities when leadership is being shared amongst international and national actors, and the really important challenge of resourcing um, dedicated coordinators at both the national and subnational level um, that was highlighted both by our presenters and by several of you in your discussions. Um, we heard from Street Child about the critical role of rapid funding um, to support local actors in acute humanitarian response. And Save the Children and Al Ghad found organization highlighted the positive impact of coaching to support national actors leading coordination groups and to identify kind of problems on an ongoing basis and how to solve them. Um, and we also um, heard um, from all panelists, um, kind of a call for greater funding, both of national NGOs themselves um, and specifically of coordination roles. Um, we have heard from all of you about your experiences and what tools and resources you might need um, 
to advocate for increased local leadership uh, in your context. And I know from jumping in and listening in to several of the breakout groups um, that many of you called um, not just for these practical tools and resources on different kinds of trainings, funding that were needed, but also for a bit of a mindset shift um, that we need um, international actors um, to see this as part of their daily work and to see it as not something that is an option that requires, oh, if we can do it, that would be nice, but rather as foundational and fundamental to how we approach humanitarian response. Um, many of your feedbacks and ideas will be reviewed and we do hope to take them into account um, in this forthcoming toolkit uh, that I mentioned. I think just to conclude for all of us, I think together all of the organizations presenting on this panel, we all recognize that humanitarian response led by well-resourced and capacitated national actors will be better able to fulfill the rights of children. But we also recognize that a great deal more work is needed to achieve that goal. Despite great examples of progress that were presented on the panel today, local leadership and child protection coordination still rem remains the exception. Um, and progress is hampered by limited funding and unequal partnerships. We really strongly encourage um, any existing coordinators, co-leads and AOR members who are, who are on the call today uh, to take up localization in their coordination groups, reach out to local and national actors and engage in these frank conversations about the barriers that prevent them from participating equally in coordination mechanisms and see what you can do to bring some of those barriers down. Uh, we call on donors to invest more in national actors and to support localization initiatives. Um, donors should particularly consider how they can support strengthening institutional capacity of local organizations. And finally, we do encourage each and every one of you um, to reach out to us following the sessions um, or continue discussions on um, the CP and COVID-19 community of practice. Um, which is being shared with you now in the chat and which is co-hosted um, co by the Alliance and the CPAOR. Um, we really hope that this is the start of the conversation and it's something that we can carry, not just, uh, carry forward, not just in the Alliance annual meeting, but also uh, in the rest of our work. And I will just say um, one last time, thank you again on behalf uh, of all of my fellow panelists. Um, and we really look forward to uh, working together to advance localization and child protection coordination. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Susanna and Fatuma and to all of the presenters. It's been a very interesting session. Lots of resources shared as well in terms of kind of ways to take this further forward. That brings to the end the first of the thematic sessions. Um, there is a five minute break and then we continue on. Um, oh, sorry, there's a 10 minute break and then we continue on at 10 past the hour. Um, we hope it gives you a chance to stretch and come off the device and, you know, move around a little bit. Um, and then to make your way back to the main Kiko room and then to choose which of the sessions you would like to re-engage with. Um, even if you want to continue on uh, with localization, which is our next session in this room, we suggest you go back to the plenary. That way you don't have to hear um, all of the, the voices back and forth as we do our checks here. So, um, you go to the Kiko chat uh, and then um, you can join your next room or come back to this room using that Zoom, um, that Zoom function. Okay, thanks everybody.